Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Shattered Glass Movie Thoughts. I am just going to go ahead and start with the ending. I love that as part of this whole how it how it worked that he made up all of these stories you know they don't just tell you that that's what it was they don't just tell you this guy was a great storyteller they show it they have us buying one of his stories the framing device of him speaking for, uh, you know, a class, you know, his old class, his old teacher, rather. It's such a great concept. I, when it dawned on us, when, when we got the reveal, you know, it, it's one of the best moments of the film because it is a kind of, you know, it, it doesn't come out of left field. It's, you know, it, we, we feel like we should have seen it coming. I don't know, maybe some people did. I certainly didn't. It just, and, and his face when you see, and then it cuts to the, you know, with them both with lawyers present, and he's just, he's a mess, you know. It's just completely destroyed him. And just, you know, when, when you think about it, it you sh we should have figured it out, you know, because as the movie progresses, we realize, certainly Hacker's Hack, Hack Heaven is, you know, fabricated, you know, that becomes more and more evident. And, you know, really, why would he be in that kind of situation after? But it's only really at the reveal that it, that we completely accept it. You know, I think also part of it is we want these things to be true. You know, the story about the young Republicans, I gotta admit, I... Maybe something like that has never actually quite happened, but it is the kind of thing that I, you know, if I read a story like that or saw a story like that on a news show, you know, in a paper, I would not really question it much, you know, some of these things and the, you know, how he tricks the Christian broadcaster to, you know, believing that he's a psychologist you know these are kind of stories that we just I really wish I could come up with an example that didn't seem to paint a nasty picture of Christians and Republicans in America but you know just in general I think you know when you hear a story that you want to be true you're going to spend less energy trying to figure out if it's correct and you know like Sarsgaard puts it he was entertaining you know he's he is a good storyteller and you know not trying to minimize what Stephen Glass in real life did I think what really should have been the case was just he should have gone directly to writing fiction you know because there's nothing wrong with making up fantastic stories and wanting people to listen to these stories. The problem arises when you try to pass that off as fact, you know, but that was one of the best, you know, kind of standout things about the movie, how it actually got you to believe in one of these stories. You know, even with all of that, even, that, that also makes you know, I don't remember her character name, but Chloe Sevigny, her reaction, you know, that she didn't want it to, she didn't want it to be true, and we don't want it to be true. We want to see him successful speaking in front of a class, you know, and that little bit with the student, I think it might even be the student who's sitting in the same spot that he was, 
and how, you know, when he starts talking about a story, she knows exactly the title and she makes a note, you know, it's his dream, it's what he wants to be the case. I have to mention the moment where he comes to Chuck after Chuck's, you know, just skimmed the various stories and he kind of realizes they're probably all fake. The, you know, the line about how he, he, he says to Chuck, he admits the voice on the phone that was my brother. And then he goes on to say, but Sims is real, I've talked to him, and, and he's, he's making up these excuses again, and it just, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it would appear he was a pathological liar, or is, I suppose. I'll be perfectly honest, I haven't really researched the real guy, I'm a movie person. And just... That, that really, that was probably the moment that hit me the hardest. You know, it just broke my freaking heart. That he's, even then, he cannot admit it. You know, he just cannot get himself to, and, and this, the frustration with Chuck, and when, when he's with Michael, you know, Hank Azaria's character, and he's trying to make it about the person, you know. He's trying to distract. It's a tactic, really. He's saying, you know, he doesn't like me because I, you know, I vouch for you. And Chloe even, you know, is like, what, do you only want people who like you? You know, and it's just this kind of, you know, and it, that, that's also part of how he got it to work. He is likable, he's easy to sympathize with, you know, it's like, you know, you want to help him, you want to make sure he succeeds, you know, and if there was one thing, I, from just watching a movie, again, not any research or anything, I'm not, if it's outside of the movie, fine. But I would like the movie to be able to stand on its own. I didn't feel like we totally understood why he did it. Why he didn't go directly to fiction. Why he worked to, you know, I, I suppose part of it is, you know, he wants to be read by important people. Like he says in the classroom. He, you know, he likes to just observe and kind of just... Yeah, I think I, w I would wager that him telling the stories before he wrote them, you know, the whole, that way he, you know, it was like he was the entertaining one in the entire, you know, of, of the um, journalists. He was the most entertaining. So he used the stories. He, you know, he told the stories there and he made them entertaining and he viewed their reactions, and then he wrote based on that. Maybe he tweaked it after that to, you know, capitalize on the things that got the biggest laughs, you know, like a comedian perfecting his set, a stand-up comedian. He used that as, you know, just... You know, he, he really was pitching. He was figuring out how to best word it, you know. A lot of fiction writers would probably like to have that kind of just have a captive audience, just be able to tell the story that they want to write or, you know, the story they want to tell, whatever their medium might be, and just be able to, you know, some are lucky enough to have that, but, you know, to get to test it like that, see the immediate reaction, and then go ahead and write it. The, I like the little moments with Sarsgaard where, you know, he, he doesn't 
just jump at the opportunity of the job, for example. You know, he's like, I, I have to discuss this with my wife, we presume. And then he comes home to the wife, and it's like, oh, he has a fever, oh, should I give him a bath? And, you know, just, he's a nice guy, you know, and it's important for it to not become, you know, the good guy versus the bad guy. The, you know, part of the real tragedy here is that Glass is in the wrong. However much we want to like him and help him and defend him, he is in the wrong. He lied to people, you know, and to such a, you know, I don't want to say important, but, you know, the, that particular audience, the people who read the magazine, you know, powerful people, he, you know, and really Chuck just wants to make sure that, you know, maybe, maybe there is some animosity as well, but it's also in part that he wants to ensure that the integrity of the paper holds up, you know. I liked the moment with when he kind of realizes that Forbes is correct, that, you know, the story is fabricated, you know, the, the, the phone conference, and there's focus on Chuck's face, and Sarsgaard just does it beautifully, just, you can tell, you can, you can practically see the hamster wheels turning, and it dawns on him, and then, you know, he goes and has the story checked, you know, goes directly to the physical, lo excuse me, location, and, excuse me, you know, and, and Glass just keeps making up excuses and adding on to the story. You know, th that's... Even if he wasn't a pathological liar, he would be nervous and anxious in that situation if, you know, even if he really thought, well, maybe he does think it's true. You know, we don't... I don't know, at least. But even if he was, even if he hadn't lied, you know, on, on some level, even a pathological, even if, you know, on some level you realize that you're lying, if you are. But, the way he keeps adding on, he, he doesn't even really pause. It's like a reflex, really. He just, he makes up lies, and they're, they're, essentially credible enough. It's just that there are so many things that don't exactly add up and how he keeps changing the story, you know, he changes the details, you know, he, he angles it like journalists are prone to do, you know. I'm not trying to diss reporters here, just... When you tell a story, when you retell events, there's going to be an angle. That's just, you know, you, you just have to accept that. There will be some slant. And he just, you know, at the end of the day, you just, you, you can't keep deluding yourself that he's, you know, and I don't think Chuck wants it to be true either. You know, for a while, he really does just want to handle the situation and he just wants to make sure that the, you know, the integrity once again holds up. And just, you know, and it hits him. He, he can't run from it any longer. Even though he doesn't, he isn't necessarily that big a fan of Steven, but he still doesn't want it to be true. He still doesn't want those stories to be lies. I suppose that's about what there is to say. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.